Hi, everyone. Cody, thank you so much for that exceptionally kind introduction. Um, I am so excited to be with you guys today. Um, I truly love creative mornings, and I mean, I am, I'm almost like a fangirl. I'm so excited to be here. The folks in this room, y'all are the makers, the creative people in town, the passionate folks making cool things happen. So to be asked to speak to y'all was truly humbling and really, really exciting. Um, a little bit about me and EPB. As mentioned, I'm the Director of Environmental Stewardship and Community at EPB. For those of you who may not know, EPB is our city-owned, community-owned electric and communications, not-for-profit um, electric and communications provider. Um, thank you. <laughs> and our mission is to increase the quality of life for the people we serve. And um, in my experience, that is absolutely true. We do that in many different ways. And um, again, it's, a, it's also a pleasure to serve this community through EPB. Today, we're going to be talking about investing. And when I think about investing, and when you all think about investing, you likely think about a few different things. You know, how do you invest your money? That's really kind of one of the more obvious things. How do you invest your time, your talent, and your resources? And when, when thinking about that, you know, two things come to mind. There's short-term investment and there's long-term investment. And today I'd like to talk to you about how in our culture it seems we've really trended towards short-term investment and what that means and how perhaps looking at things through a long-term view can really be advantageous and, and how that has affected my personal experience. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you all about today is, is pretty personal, but I'm hopeful that uh, something I say may be useful to you guys. Uh, so with that, um, this is a slide that describes investments and essentially how long a shareholder holds an investment. And as you can see, there's really been quite a trend downward since 1960. In 1960, the average shareholder held their investment for around eight years, and then that ticks down until today, where you see, um, well, until the year 2000, where you see that that investment is really held for about a year. So if we step back and think about what that means in practical terms, how would that affect decision makers at a given company? How would they start to think about how they invest their resources, how they invest in their people, what become priorities, maybe at the expense of other priorities. And today, the average shareholder holds their stock only three to four months. So what does that mean for our organizations? What does that mean for our consciousness around our work and how our leaders are thinking about investment? Uh, I would submit that it may mean that we are sacrificing our long-term vision for short-term gain. Another thing that's come into being is the 24-hour news cycle. I'm not here to pass judgment on how quickly we all get information. In many ways, it's a great thing. Uh, just a little note here, the Washington Post publishes over 1,000 articles, graphics, and stories, visuals every day. And that's actually about the rate of more than one story every two minutes. Even if you're a speed reader, and this is just one newspaper, your ability to absorb information is limited. Uh, and then our hard-hitting stories, the big headlines that grab our attention, like, say, the international headline of the fire in Notre Dame. Even those big stories, uh, data shows that it captures our national consciousness for only about one week, and then we move on to something else. And this brings me to our time spent online. Not judging time spent online. I spend a lot of my life online, as my iPhone tells me. Uh, but one thing that's interesting is how much it's creeped up since the year 2000. Um, we've more than doubled our time online. We now spend close to 24 hours a week online. And when we're online, uh, on average, we're only spending 17 seconds to three minutes on any given web page. Then when we think about the life cycle of our goods, I mean, we know now when we go to any store, we buy something online, things are designed to be easy. Often things are designed to be disposable. Uh, so one example of this is our clothing and our relationship to it. Uh, the average lifetime of a piece of clothing in our country is three years, and every year we throw away around 81 pounds of clothing. So I would argue that we've developed a cultural culture of short-termism. And while sometimes thinking short-term is necessary and absolutely appropriate, what does it mean when our whole culture has been focused on the short-term? I think what it means is that when you focus entirely on short-term results, you don't allow things to grow to their full potential. 
And that includes us. That includes our potential as creators, as folks who can have an impact about things we're passionate about. And sometimes when we're too focused on the here and now, we can forget you know, that we're here, hopefully, for quite some time. Um, I love the website Wait But Why. I think this guy, uh, the guy who writes it, is incredibly funny and insightful. And one of the most popular articles he's written is about the time that we have here on planet Earth and what we do with it. Um, some folks have told me that this uh, article is a little bit too real, so if you find it disturbing, I apologize in advance. Um, I personally found it really empowering. So what you're looking at right now is a human life as measured in 90 years, and um, it takes you from birth all the way to age 90. And what's really profound about this image to me is that you can actually visualize your life in little dots. Um, my favorite one is weeks, um, but it wouldn't fit on the slide. Uh, and what's really empowering about this is when you can actually see your, hopefully, you know, be grateful, anyone be grateful to live to 90, um, when you see your life carried out in these little dots, you realize that you have essentially all the time in the world, but very limited time. So how you spend that time is incredibly important. And you can be strategic when you know what you're working with. So is there another way? Can we start thinking about things through the lens of the long term? And what does long term really mean? I don't have the answers. I work toward this every day, but I'll give you a little bit from my perspective. The first thing that I'd like to ask you guys to really think about is what did you care about before we each had a 24-7 audience, before we had social media, before any accomplishment that we hoped to make would be news, you know, at least to our family and friends. Um, at any given time, you know, someone from middle school or elementary school could know what we're up to. So what was that thing that sparked your creativity, that got you excited before you had to worry about what other people thought of it? For me, that thing has really always been the environment. Um, here I'm wearing all jean everything, so I peg this mid-1990s. I'm uh, between eight and 10 here, roughly. And from a young age, I just felt really interconnected to all things. I sensed that um, the environment had an impact on our quality of life, and that was really important to me. Um, and more than that, I had the profound experience early in my childhood of living in a neighborhood that was contaminated by chemical waste. Uh, that experience showed me firsthand that when the environment is disregarded, people suffer, and they suffer in real, real ways. Uh, so I knew that for me, finding that space, that intersection between human health and environmental stewardship well, what was, is what was going to be meaningful for me. Um, but how I got there, you know, that, that was uh, and continues to be a journey. So very often, you know, I continually ask myself, why? Why this thing? Um, and for me, you know, thinking about Chattanooga and why we all love it here. I mean, how many of you all love to spend your weekends outside? Um, on our trails, um, by our beautiful river. You know, we have really big challenges, challenges that we've overcome in the past. I mean, I'd be remiss not to talk about environmental stewardship and the fact that Walter Cronkite once called Chattanooga the dirtiest city in the world. We've all heard that. But we also have new challenges that we need to face with a long-term view. You know, for example, Chattanooga is the sixth fastest warming city in the United States. Um, and what that means in practical terms is that by the year 2050, we may have up to 50 danger days in a given year. And danger days refer to days that are above 105 degrees, days when it's generally not safe to be outside. Um, we also face challenges with our beautiful Tennessee River. A recent study from the Tennessee Aquarium, supported by the aquarium, uh, showed that our beautiful river has 8,000 times the amount of microplastics than a similar river that runs through Europe. These are really big problems that will take much more than a short-term focus. And then my last why, when I really think about it, is for our future, for our children, for our grandchildren, for children we haven't even met yet. We have a responsibility to think long-term about their health and their well-being. When we think about the things we love about Chattanooga, we love being outside, we love a fresh strawberry from the Chattanooga market, that juicy tomato during the summer, in order to protect these everyday delights, we need a long-term focus. So long-term focus, this is me. This is my uh, first birthday that I spent at EPB. Uh, according to LinkedIn, um, I have been there 12 years and nine months. It's flown by. <laughs> so in millennial time, I'm close to retirement. 
uh, <laughs> um, and a, a sweet co-worker de uh, decorated my cubicle uh, for my 23rd birthday. Um, and really, I've been so lucky at EPB. I've been given the opportunity to be an intrapreneur, um, which is being an entrepreneur without the risk. I'm sorry for those of you who are entrepreneurs. There is risk, it's just, it's not the same thing, so I won't pretend it is. But I've had the opportunity to be creative, and I've had the opportunity to create programs that uh, were centered on my passion, which is environmental stewardship in the community. And over time, those programs grew, and over time they multiplied until it was enough for a full-time job. And today, um, I have a little more responsibility than I did at 23, and I continue to be challenged and grow, which is a wonderful thing. One other thing about working for EPB, which has been wonderful, is that EPB also shares a long-term view. EPB has been part of this community since the 1930s. Um, and today, you know, we've gone from being a distributor of TVA electricity to having one of the most advanced smart grids in North America, uh, and also being the first in the nation to offer a gigabit of internet service. And I can tell you, I started at a really pivotal time. I started right before we launched the fiber optic business. And I was really humbled by how long it actually took to make something that big happen and how many people it took to make something like that happen. And in fact, it took the whole community to make something like that happen. Uh, and I really began to realize that, you know, big things, big things that scale and have the potential to affect thousands of people's lives, they take time. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the long term, uh, longish term, 12 years, uh, that I've spent devoting my career to environmental stewardship and community, and a few ways that I've thought about that lens, and I hope that it's helpful to you. So when talking about sustainability, one of the first things you'll see in a Google return search is the triple bottom line. And the triple bottom line is really a wonderful way to think about just about anything. Um, when thinking about a sustainability project, uh, the return that you're asked to look for is people. So how does it affect people? typically their health and well-being, how does it affect the well-being of the planet, and of course, what's your financial return? And when you're really lucky, you hit all three of those things with the same project. Doesn't always happen, but that's the goal. And really, if we think about anything we're working on, it's not a bad guide. This is one of my heroes. His name is Ray Anderson, and he is the founder of a company called Interface Carpet. It's right down the road in Atlanta. Ray Anderson uh, founded Interface Carpet several decades ago and um, wasn't really interested in the environment, considered himself a conventional businessman, until he started getting questions from customers about what his company was doing for the environment. And he didn't have a good answer for them. Then he got concerned and he thought, oh my goodness, are we losing business because we don't have a sustainable product? And the answer was that he was. So he began reading. Um, he read The Ecology of Commerce by Paul Hawken, great book if you haven't read it. And he became a changed man overnight. He called himself a reformed plunderer, and he decided to take a stand against our conventional take, make, waste system. And what I love about what he did is he got in front of his company and he told them all during an all-hands-on-deck meeting that they were going to commit to climbing Mount Sustainability. And he developed a philosophy around what it was going to take to become a net zero impact, no harm to the environment company by the year 2020. And he was saying this in the 90s, when the technology didn't exist for them to not have any impact. But he committed to the vision. And today, that company has reached their goal ahead of time They've doubled their profits, increased their business, and it's an amazing success story. Now they're talking about how they're not going to not only not do any harm, but better than that, create a positive value uh, with their products. It's an amazing story. And uh, Ray Anderson is, is definitely a hero in our space. So in thinking long term, I found it really advantageous to invest in systems. No matter what you're into, there's probably a system that's been created for it. Um, you know, if you think about environmental stewardship, a cynical lens, and I'll be it true sometimes, is greenwashing. You know, there are companies out there, unfortunately, that market their items as being green when they're not. Systems can really help combat this. So at EPB, these are just a few of the systems that we've invested in over the long term. You know, for example, LEED certification, which is the gold standard for green buildings across the world. Um, we've committed to recertifying our downtown building every single year. That keeps us honest, that keeps us on track. Um, and here are a few others. I, I won't go too far into them at any detailed level, 
but I bring them to your attention because they're a really, really important, um, they're an important ladder. You know, if you, wanna, if you want to scale your programs over time, it creates some scaffolding and some structure. So once you have some systems in place, some uh, knowledge that you know you need to get, um, investing in yourself is incredibly important. For me personally, that's meant pursuing different credentials, you know, continually learning, keeping those credentials up. It's meant going to conferences and reading books. And I think for whatever your passion is, there's got to be ways to invest in yourself. And it's hard to take the time when you've got meeting after meeting and your phone's pinging you all the time. But setting aside a few hours a week just to study and really get to know your craft better, um, it's time well spent. This is one that I definitely um, you know, have to stay on top of myself about, but investing in the time to get it right. You know, as our programs have grown, the need for data has grown. And so today, EPB has invested in a software system that captures 130 streams of data related to our impact on the environment. But our measurement of how well we're doing is tied to the integrity of our data. So I'm continually checking that software system, making sure that the data inputs are correct, making sure that folks know, you know what data they're supposed to enter, um, and trying to think of ways to make this data more relevant. Um, and it is, it is an immense challenge, but these are the kinds of systems that while on a day-to-day -day basis they're not the exciting stuff, um, it's the stuff that actually determines your performance. Another really important thing that I've learned is that it's really important to be inclusive. You know, at EPB, a lot of our programs touch folks in limited income communities, and uh, one of our signature programs, Home Energy Upgrade, um, is a, it's a wonderful program in which we'll invest up to $10 a square foot in limited income homes um, with the goal of reducing their energy burden and increasing their quality of life and their health. Uh, when we were first implementing this program, it, it really uh, hit home early on that we needed to get buy-in and input um, and meaningful input from the folks who lived in these communities. And so we touched base with community leaders. We talked to neighborhood association presidents, vice presidents. Um, we got really involved in the youth and family development centers. And I can tell you that that was really, really valuable time. And so whenever you're working on anything, you know, who's not at the table who should be? And I think that that has been incredibly important to our success uh, in this program. Along those same lines, investing in feedback. Uh, these pictures are from early in our journey. Uh, that top picture is of our very first purchasing fair at EPB. We had changed our purchasing policies and we're asking folks to purchase a certain percentage of sustainable goods uh, and office supplies. And uh, so we held a purchasing fair, and we showed these folks what the new products look like, let them touch and feel them, and that made the process go so much smoother. And we learned a lot about what products were good and which products folks didn't like. And at the bottom there, uh, that is a project that we were working on where we allowed employees to choose which sustainability measures they wanted the company to pursue. And we were really transparent with the data. Um, our employees chose their top five, and if we couldn't make one of them happen, we just explained why. And that process of engagement and transparency made the whole process go so much smoother. Next, I say investing in relationships and culture is incredibly important. Um, I know for me, I personally have never done anything meaningful alone, and it has not happened. So uh, taking the time to invest in the folks who you ultimately need uh, to carry out your goals is one of the most valuable ways you can spend your time. Um, it may mean hours on the phone. It may mean you know, creating 30-minute increments for an entire two days just to get everybody's input on what you need to do. Um, this is a more fun version of that. This is a large group of EPB employees um, going to Eco Field Days, which is happening again this year in April. I um, encourage you guys to go. It's a lot of fun. Um, but taking the time to create bonding experiences and make sure that people trust each other. Um, it's incredibly important to the long-term success of any program. So once you have your feet under you, um, bringing up other leaders, so lucky at EPB we have several green building leaders that lead green operations in each one of our buildings. Um, these are some folks celebrating some milestones with green light certification, which I recommend to anyone. It's a local certification here uh, done by Green Spaces. Um, and these folks just are, you can see, just the joy on their faces. And bringing people along and teaching more folks to do what you've been doing um, just ensures its long-term sustainability. 
I'm also a big believer in failing safely. I know the mantra in the startup world is move fast and break things, and that may work. Um, but I found that starting small, uh, pilots uh, de-risk big ideas, which long term can really make your idea successful. There are programs where I've literally started them on one floor and then moved to another floor and then another until it was the whole building. Um, but even though it takes longer as a startup time, those programs still exist today. Um, so big believer in starting small, just starting. Uh, another thing to try is just investing in a vision, one year, three year, five years. Um, folks maybe more imaginative than I am can go longer, but um, for me, you know, just thinking about things in this lens of time is really, really helpful. Um, and I think probably everyone can relate to that. This one was new to me. Um, after I had my first child, I really started getting serious about budgeting time. Um, and this, uh, this spreadsheet is a free resource from a book called I Know How She Does It, all about how to manage your time. Um, and what you're seeing is, is a little obnoxious. It's a time journal in 15 minute increments over the space of a week. It is painful to do, uh, especially at first. But what I found in doing this, and I continue to go back to it whenever I'm feeling overwhelmed or have the false belief I can't accomplish something that's important to me, is that when you really look at your time at this level of intensity, you find where, not necessarily that you're wasting time, but where you're prioritizing time that you can move around. And so I highly recommend it. If you're interested, you could go search it on a website. But thinking about your time and this level of detail can help you accomplish your long-term goals. So to start wrapping up, when we think about the benefits of a long-term vision, the first thing that comes to mind is that everyone sitting in this room is the recipient and the um, you know, grateful recipient of someone's long-term vision. What you're seeing is the Chattanooga Riverfront in the 1970s or 80s and what it looks like today. If it weren't for a group of thoughtful citizens who started thinking through a long-term vision and slowly acting on that for decades, none of us would have the beautiful city that we have today. So the benefits of a long-term vision is that you're able to do big things, you're able to scale, um, and you're also able to take breaks, which is really important. And you know, make investments in other things, like family and travel, things that make you a more well-rounded person and ultimately um, help your ability to make a big impact. So I'd like to leave you guys um, with the thought of, you know, in your working life, if you're lucky, if you start at 22 and you were lucky enough to retire at 65, you have 43 good working years. It's actually a really long time. So what are you going to do with your 43 years? Thank you.